hope everybody is having a nice day. This is the fourth or fifth year that we've uh, been doing this call. Um, it's been a really fantastic way to get some new ideas for people who don't have them and just as importantly validate for people who do like, hey, that idea that you have that you're not sure about is totally worth pursuing. Um, and the real truth is almost anything is worth pursuing. Like it's a big audience. There are people in there who want to hear about all the various things, even the ones where you're like, oh, I found that nobody else does. Uh, you're not that special. The things that you think are awesome, we also think are awesome. Uh, so I also want to say that um, so far pretty much, every, I'm now going to have performance anxiety, but so far pretty much every year that we've done this, uh, our top submissions in terms of like voting of the, the program committee ended up coming from this meeting. Um, and the review process is anonymous, but some of the reviewers are here on this call, and I very strongly remember comments that are like, oh, I totally remember this person at the CFP call. Oh, my God, I'm so excited. I'm so glad they submitted it. So, um, yeah, I have high hopes is what I'm saying, you guys. Pressure's on. Um, we have a bunch of wonderful people here today but I want to introduce specifically a few of them who are either on the program committee or who I told y'all would be here. So <laughs> I feel like I should do that. Um, so Godfrey and Yehuda are both here. They're both going to be speaking at the conference. They're both on the program committee. Uh, Melanie is here and Jen is here who are both on the core team and who I suspect will end up being on the stage, even though I don't at this point know what they're going to be doing while they're there. Um, I see past speakers, like I definitely saw a little Jessica Jordan headshot floating around at some point, even though I don't see her anymore. I see Vaidehi, I see um, past volunteers and other speakers, and James is a speaker, and I can't see all your uh, icons. Chris spoke at BonusCon last year. I can't see all your headshots at the same time, so if I'm not calling you out, it's not because I forgot you, it's because you don't happen to be on the random assortment of people on the screen right now. Um, so the first thing I want to do is ask just a few of those people to introduce themselves briefly. Um, and talk about either some of their past experiences with this call or what they're optimistic about for today. So, um, Yehuda, do you want to start us off? Uh, we can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Blue Jeans was like, you cannot be heard. Maybe you don't want to be muted. Um, okay, so I've been uh, obviously doing EmberConf talk since uh, so I'm Yehuda. I was a co-creator of Ember. I've been doing EmberConf talk since EmberConf was called EmberCamp. Um, and I I want to second what Leah said about some of the best talks come out of this brainstorming. I think a lot of people come into this thing having sort of like a rough idea, like maybe they'll think, oh, I want to give a talk on testing or something. And actually having a few back and forth rounds to figure out like what might be interesting to the community, to the committee, et cetera, is always makes the proposals better. Um, I also want to say that in term, if for people who don't know, the proposal process itself is iterative, um, which means that you can submit a proposal and there's a few rounds where the committee members will give you responses back and allow you to modify the proposal. So if you, I think coming out of this, you should just write a draft proposal if you have an idea for one. And don't worry so much about getting it perfect the first time. The point at which anybody is really like grading or judging your proposal is really at the very end when the committee sits down to look at the finished proposals. So don't like, I would say the theme of this is like get feedback early and often and we're trying to give you as many opportunities as possible to do that. Cool. Um, Melanie, I we heard from you a little bit, but do you want to? Introduce yourself and add anything to that? Sure. Uh, I'm going to pitch the same talk that I have for the past couple years. I still think someone should do a talk that's like integrating a piece of music that starts out simple and increases in complexity and it compares that parallel to Ember somehow. Uh, I will tell you, full disclosure, I bought a cello to give this talk. 
Uh, I have almost finished paying for this cello. It's almost paid off, and I still have not learned how to use it. Uh, but someday I will see this top on stage, and please feel free to steal this idea uh, and use it because that would be awesome. And I would say we need people to speak about ideas, so why not you? There's everything. You can learn everything. Like, I took some lessons to learn how to give talks, and I still say um and uh a little bit too much, and I still kind of wander in my head and maybe down a rabbit hole or two. But I'm out there talking about a thing that I think our community needs to pay attention to. And, like, that's it. That, you're the person. You're the person coming to give the talk. You don't wait for someone else to do it. And if you want help, we're here for you. Awesome. Uh, Jen, I don't see you anymore, but I assume you're here. Want to say anything and introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Jen Weber. I've been helping out with learning team stuff for quite some time. And starting uh, around this time last year, I also joined the framework, framework core team. Um, and I guess my own speaking experience has been, uh, it was kicked off by uh, somebody else involved in the Ember community who um, heard me talking about my idea for a meetup talk and said, hey, you should submit that for EmberConf. And I was like, no way is that gonna like be a thing. I don't know what I'm hardly even doing with this meetup talk. Um, and he said, that's okay, do it anyway, you'll figure it out, you have six months. So um, that is kind of what led to public speaking, and it's been one of the most rewarding things that um, I've done, I think, in my technical career. It's given me so many opportunities to connect with other people and to like share and learn and grow, as well as to um, help expand the knowledge that's available to everybody else. Um, and I guess what I'll say as well, for my like one piece of advice is uh, if you are feeling nervous about the idea of giving a talk in front of a bunch of people, um, good, like that's normal. Um, if you're not nervous, wow, you're so lucky, but um, like it, I always uh, feel deep regret like the day before I'm supposed to give a talk. I'm like, why did I sign up for this? And I always feel very nervous before I get up on stage. And um, the like, I don't ever regret giving a talk when I'm on the other side of it. I'm like so happy that I did it. So, you know, um, I encourage everyone to use this as an opportunity to challenge yourself. And even if the talk um, isn't chosen for EmberConf, you have a very strong foundation for giving it at a meetup, giving it at another type of conference. Um, and like, it just opens up so many opportunities after you take the time to do that planning and the thinking about what you want to share. Yeah, and um, there's more people to introduce, but I do want to add a couple things to that. Um, you had made a comment like six months uh, and I want to uh, focus on that, which is to say, you don't actually have to have your talk ready to get your proposal in, which I, like sounds obvious, but isn't. And I myself like impose oftentimes a standard of like, well, I don't know if it's going to be any good until it's completely finished. So I can't submit it until it's completely finished. But that means you need to be finished with your talk for next March by like November. And that's not happening. And even if it did happen, it would be stale by the time you got to March. So all you need at this stage is the idea um, and like an outline, right? A rough outline of what you want to talk about. You don't actually need to know exactly what's going to go inside and you don't even need to have necessarily learned what's going to go on each side. There's like a, a, a burden that people have thinking like, oh, I need to be an expert. And when they approach this topic, they think to themselves, what am I an expert in? Um, but a lot of people don't personally consider themselves to be experts in anything um, just because we're all like nice, modest human beings, um, and because we're always learning more and more things. Uh, you don't need to be an expert, and oftentimes the best person to teach something is somebody who very recently learned it, because they can remember the mindset of the person 
who is learning it versus like a seasoned expert who's been doing the exact same thing for a really long time. Um, I was somewhat off topic, but uh, I follow somebody on Instagram. Uh, her name is Lenora Porter, I think. And she's been learning Ember and she does a lot of uh, posts of like little videos and little things. And just yesterday she did one that sort of clarified what she was up to for me. And she was like, oh, by the way, the reason I'm doing this, the reason that I've been um, on here for like weeks and weeks in a disciplined fashion, telling you about Ember Octane and watching you, letting you watch me learn is because I decided to volunteer to teach Octane to my team at work and I have to do that in a month. Um, so here I am learning it. Uh, and it like it, it was very appropriate timing considering this call today. But um, all the time during her learning, by the way, I didn't think like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. I thought like, oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. And like watching her learn it was meaningful for me. Um, but knowing that she's doing it to give a talk very much like the one that we might be hearing from a bunch of you uh, made me very happy yesterday. Um, and then the other thing is, if you're nervous, same thing. Good. Be nervous. It's great. It'll push you to do well. Just don't let it overwhelm you. But also, like, there are so many people here who want to help and want to support you. Um, and that means dry runs over the phone along the way ahead of the conference. That means lots of people who really want to review your outline and give you ideas, review your slides, give you ideas, all the way up to, like, a space at EmberConf the day before the conference where you can, like, get up on a stage and give your talk and do a legit dry run. Um, and... The next things on their, those lists are basically whatever you can think of. There are a lot of people here who want to help you, and so if you come up with something that's going to be helpful to you, uh, we want to do it. Um, so next, I saw uh, Kenny Bolo pop up. Uh, can you hear us? You want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit um, about your ambitions for today? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm a bit late. Uh, I'm Thomas. I work at LinkedIn and also maintain a few add-ons like Ember Fetch and Pretender. So, uh, so I, uh, I don't know what you guys talked before, but uh, I'm just basically want to get some feedback on the ideas of what kind of proposal I can get. So, um, so I'm thinking of maybe I can talk about how to do like error tracking in Ember apps, like. Uh, people may know this Ember on error or window on error or how to catch a promise error or how error tracking works in a fast boot mode. Uh, so I think that might be helpful if I can get a talk for that topic. And I, I I'm also thinking about doing some like maybe, uh, how real user monitoring works, all the performance markers and how Ember apps boot and transition phases is like. So uh, do you think those topics would be uh, good for a conference talk? So both of those sound like good topics, and I don't think anyone mentioned this yet, but you can definitely feel free to submit more than one talk. Um, having done selection for many, many years, it I can't even think of one time where it hurt somebody to have more than one talk. It might not necessarily mean that the one that you thought was better gets selected, but that's fine. Um, I think you would prefer that, basically. So uh, in terms of the two talks, I think if you just only focus on the Ember.on error, even with fast food, I think that's like more of the size of a lightning talk. But I think if you add in general error handling, like how to think about promises failing, uh, error state, things like that, I think that makes sense as a full talk. Basically, like how to handle errors in Ember, and I also don't think that there, I can't think of a talk that I can remember that already covered the topic in the past. So I think that's great. Um, I also, if you do the real user monitoring talk, I would, when you started saying it, I was thinking I wasn't that interested in it, but then you talked more about the details of how to think about how RUM fits into the Ember model of transitioning. And that does sound interesting to me. Um, the, that topic itself also sounds a little small on its own, but you also, I think if you if you fleshed it out, there's a, to, a talk there. So both of those, I guess my general feedback here is like, be cognizant of the 30 minute limit, but still try to cover more than one narrow topic. Like if you could imagine giving the talk as a lightning talk, try to think mm -hmm. about, a, not don't like add more topics, but try to think about how to flesh out the topic so that it was like so that it fit into a bigger slot. 
Ja. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, ah, I see you now. Hi, Penuolo. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Hi. Uh, this is the one other person who I also wanted to introduce who spoke at Evermont last year um, and did fabulous and is getting more involved this year. And that's a common trend, by the way, is once I get my hands into you and I get you involved in some part of Evercom, I just start pulling and pulling. Um, so why don't you introduce yourself and, uh, I don't know, say something. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, I'm Steven. Um, I'm a software engineer that's based over in Finland, uh, originally from London, and I've been in Finland for a couple of years now. Uh, I've been doing conference speaking for about uh, three three years thereabouts, um, and I've I've loved it. I've enjoyed uh, every bit of it. I think that the 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 one thing that I found interesting was uh, speaking at conferences is taking me from being an introvert to actually being an extrovert. Because uh, during my masters, I was the one person who uh, literally said nothing in class, uh, but. Uh, going to conferences and uh, speaking to people helped me overcome uh, most of the stage fright, and it's also helped me connect with a lot of people. So I think the one one advice I would I would give would be uh, something I found really helpful uh, for myself and my talks. Uh, when you have an idea and you're not so sure about it, uh, it's always good to actually have a group of people uh, you can actually brainstorm with. So. Uh, the last year, I did it together with Chris and Jessica. Uh, we had a couple of topics uh, that we were interested in, in, and we basically brainstormed together and tried to pitch the topic to each other. And uh, doing that basically helped us to see uh, if it was making sense in terms of the audience or if it needed to be tweaked a little bit. Um, and I think it was important because it basically helped us to get proper feedback uh, even before actually submitting the CFP. So it's more like getting feedback from your own peers who are also working in the industry and asking, is this something you would actually like to hear at a conference? Uh, and then, of course, people need to be honest with you. Uh, we were quite blunt with each other, so I, I would say that was pretty helpful. But, yeah, um, that, I think that's pretty much what I have to say for now. If you, if you are, are doubting your idea or you're not ex extremely sure about the idea, then it might be a good it might actually be good to uh, part, go, go through it with some other person who will understand and try to find out if this is something that will be interesting for them to listen. And if they say not so interesting, then try to find out why, because they could give you good pointers to actually modify the talk when you do that also. Yeah, and I, I want to also say that that, I, that really does happen. I think the difference between someone who iterated on their talk, not to be a broken record here on iteration, but is – it's like the difference between a talk that might have nothing to do with something that could be accepted and like the best talk in the conference. And that's just not just from iterating after it was accepted, that's from iterating before you submitted it. Um, I know, uh, Stephen, you have already started to do a little bit of reviewing of proposals. So you can back me up when I say uh, very little, like very few proposals come in that are like, actually terrible or embarrassing, right? Like, not everyone's going to make the cut, but most things that people want to pitch and most ideas that people have are good and decent and a good start. Um, and uh, don't let your doubts stop you from joining the list, basically. Would yeah, you I, I, the only talks that I would, I don't know what you're asking, but the only talks that I would say are embarrassing are people who submit talks who are obviously not part of the Ember community and are submitting, like, a prefab talk that like has nothing to do with Ember at all, or like mentions Ember as a templating matter. I, I don't mean that. I mean as they they took their talk and they wrote the word Ember in it because they were supposed to do that in the conference, or like one line proposals. Like yeah, a proposal I mean, that's like I'm going to give a talk on testing. Those are yes. I would say are embarrassing. And I shouldn't use the word embarrassing because I don't want to be like like I guess those people are probably not at home crying either. But like yes, don't submit a talk that completely has nothing to do with Ember at all. Um, and that's actually like a wide guideline because there are a lot of general concepts that belong here just as they belong at a Python conference or a million other different technical conferences or even non-technical conferences. But where you just have to like 
insert that little tweak to make it more relevant to the people who are going to be hearing it, right? Yeah. Maybe adjust yeah, I, your examples to be written in Ember if it's a general computer programming concept or something like that. Yes, um, I should clarify that I am not saying that you, you, if you, for example, we've had accessibility talks that are, I would say, in many ways, a very vanilla accessibility talk, but we accepted ones where somebody made it clear that they were going to spend the time to understand how it fit into Ember. Because people can go online and watch a, even an important general purpose talk, but people, it's not just, it's not just about making it like relevant in a abstract sense or philosophical sense. It's about making the talk useful to the users that you're, that are in the room, right? Like if you say, make sure to use a button instead of whatever, instead, like I'm using accessibility example, but a better thing to say is the action helper or the on helper has these issues in Ember and here are some other patterns that you could use that would be more accessible. Right. Whereas if you gave the talk that you would give to the Chrome Dev Summit, you would just say, don't use an event handler here, use button. And those are different. But there's small tweaks that can be applied to somewhat yes, you, generic. You ideas. just have to be an Ember community member. I think that's the bottom line. You have to already you have to know what Ember is and what how what you're trying to say affects Ember. Yeah. Um, I th think where I was going before was um, I think Melanie and Stephen have both started looking at a couple of um, proposals. How are you feeling so far about the stuff that's coming in an anonymous, tell me happy things way, uh, Stephen? <laughs> uh, I, I would say I would say it's been quite good uh, in my opinion. Um, a lot of the talks have been that have come in have been quite high level. Um, it's quite difficult now. Uh, with rating because uh, you're reading so many good stuff and then you're thinking like how you know how do I read this yeah so uh, in my opinion it's been quite good uh, I, I've gone through a couple of them I think the ones that came in earlier uh, during the first two weeks I think yeah and it's been good it's been really good it's been some really great talks and I'm hoping that we will get w w way much more and it's going to make the job more difficult for us yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm not on the program committee and I'm the only person who gets to see everything unblind so I'm glad that you said that they all see that a lot of them seem really good. And I want to add that I don't know most of the people who um, submitted these talks. So it's not like it's just like the same 10 people submitting over and over again and they're our buddies. So we rank them highly and then they get to get on stage. Um, we try and promote the CFP widely. And then um, I'm always excited. Like I get really excited. I spent this morning actually just like Googling random people whose names are in there just for my own personal interest because I was like, oh, I don't know you. Who are you? Um, and they all look really good. <laughs> uh, okay. Next up, uh, let's go to somebody random. Who has an idea that they um, want to get some thoughts on? And what you got? It gets scary. Um... So I gave a lightning talk at Emberfest, um, and I see some people who were there who have actually seen it. And um, <clears throat> a lot of them encouraged me to also write a CFP for EmberConf. Um, and I've been brainstorming a bit with uh, Jen about it. So what I did at Ember Fast was basically explain how I, as a non-Ember developer, became involved in contributing to, especially the Ember Times, but also being your personal I upload thumbsters person <laughs> for the website. Um, and I um, thought that might be nice, but I recently also discovered that with my background in psychology, it might be interesting to add on something about uh, social psychology related to online communities and open source contributing um, somewhere along the lines or touching also upon some research that at least um, Jessica also posted in her blog post. Um, so something along these lines, and I would really like to, but I don't know how yet, um, do something interactive. Um, That's which really is scary. Hard. It's really like, do you remember Gavin's talk when he did that? Uh, yes. It was such a hit. <laughs> yes. So, no, the, the thing that I would like to do or I'm thinking about is doing some kind of 
experiment-ish to show how you get people involved or connecting. Uh, and I was thinking if I could do somehow something that people who are first time there or are there alone somehow get appreciation for being there, but also feel part of the group. Because I know, for example, Isaac somehow fi found us last year at EmberConf, and he's now completely involved and in giving amazing talks. Um, so he managed on him uh, on his himself, but I think there are also people who need a bit of extra help. Yeah, um, um, I like all those things, and which doesn't help you narrow it down. I know, but uh, <laughs> that reminds me of a larger point I want to make. So just in general, in the world, like I really love that computer science right now has so many uh, career changers. Um, and I love it professionally in terms of like the people who we hire at my company. I, I just love the fact that like there's so many different backgrounds that people are bringing to the table where they have expertise in a thing that the rest of us know nothing about, but that can totally help the actual computer programming that we do every day. Uh, psychology is an easy one. And by easy, I mean like, big win, not that getting your psychology degree or whatever was easy, I, I can't speak to that. Um, but it's one that comes up over and over again because everybody wants to understand how people think and how people work. Um, and we love having a few talks on the agenda that are always like a little bit off the cuff like that, where like maybe it is a talk that's mostly about like the human brain, but then how it relates to um, the community. We've had that in the past. I, the one that's coming to mind right now is when uh, Casey Watts did a talk about um, neuroscience and programming, but uh, I don't even remember that talk specifically, so I'm not I'm not necessarily saying it's a benchmark, but I think that's a great um, topical area that has a lot of new, fresh content to mine. Um, Yehuda, I saw you nodding. Was there something you wanted to add? Uh, I am agreeing with everything you said. I think this is a really good example of something where the Ember connection has, like, needs to exist and, it, and would be easy to to forget about or make very light. I think um, we talked about the music, Gavin's talk, and I think he did a good job of making that like super fun and the fun act. If you were if you were in the audience and you didn't know Ember, it would still have been a fun talk, right? But it wasn't. If he went on the road and gave it at React Conf, that wouldn't make sense. He would have to make significant tweaks to it. So I think I agree with Leia that I liked a lot of what you said. I um, I also agree with Leia that taking advantage of stuff that you already are an expert in from a previous career is something that can make a talk really interesting. Um, and, and I think... Uh, confidence. Yes. And I, th I think the thing that's cool about, like Leia said, the thing that's cool about the programming ecosystem is that we're all really good at, like a big part of our job is taking complicated things and making them digestible. Like that's, that's what we do. And so taking, like thinking about something you that you were an expert in in the past and thinking about how to break it down and make it digestible for, a, for an audience is actually kind of in our wheelhouse in terms of what we, what we do, especially as front-end programmers. So I like, I like talks like that. I think they're good. Cool. I have one more question. Uh, I was thinking about submitting it as a 15-minute talk. Do I have to decide that when I write my CFP or can people help me upon deciding this? I, so there's no like um, button to toggle in the system for I'm not sure, uh, but you do have sections that are like speak to the program committee. This doesn't go in a, in a on a website somewhere, but you can explain to them your qualification or whatever or anything else you want to say. And that's a good spot to say like I've submitted it as X, but I'm also open to it uh, being Y. And we do periodically see that. And sometimes we'll also get stuff where people will in a talk and the reviewers would be like, hey, this is a really great idea, but I don't think it's enough for 30 minutes. It should be 15 or it should be even a bonus comp talk, which is part of why we introduced the 15 minute experiment this year. We'll have to see how that goes. Yeah, that's, cool. that's actually also, I think it's important for people, like that is a good question that Leah, maybe we could find a way to like put in prose somewhere around the application. Um, you, the FAQ, like, for sure. You can, add, you can submit a talk that has some, you have to check off some things in the, in the submission, and you can write whatever you want in the, in the program committee box, which could include, I really didn't know what to fill out here, and especially if you get it in like reasonably early. This, this is what I, I mean by iteration. Like if you get something in reasonably early, you can 
you should try not to be like sloppy or one linery or whatever. But if you're just like, I really need help figuring out the answer to these characteristics, people are really usually pretty excited about helping. Yeah. So like, the only really asterisk, focus on filling it out. Yeah. The only asterisk that I wanted to add, because you mentioned interactivity, um, is a thing that I now, I need to, every year basically I have a long list of stuff that I send to speakers once they're accepted, which are like, Pro tips, don't do this, don't do that, whatever. Or here's some ideas, here's good tools for slides. One thing that I need to add to that list is it almost never goes well when at the beginning of the talk people are like, raise your hand if X, raise your hand if Y. Um, for a variety of reasons, including like people just don't like raising their hands. Um, or you might have asked the question that the answer is in fact not a few people for it. But the reason I don't like it is because the lackluster response that I almost always gets gives the speaker like that immediate like oh crap, they're not with me like the audience is not paying attention or nobody cares or whatever and like you don't want to or, start I, or I guess I think like you're hoping to get a particular reaction and what if you don't get your it? talk and if you don't get it like you should still give the talk you were planning on giving but it really demoralizes you um, yeah I, there's also a bunch of other things I would say like you really have to say raise your hand something something if you can something something which like just don't sign up for that. Like you, like you have to do it when you ask people to do physical things, but for no reason at all, like don't do that. Um, also, uh, I think in general, it really, like, I don't like when the, the presidential debates do it because it like takes a nuanced question and turns it into like this binary thing. Like, are you a blah programmer or not? And I think that just doesn't add a lot of value. Like it's very rare. It's like, it's usually like a, a raise your hand if you've written texts or something, and like, like what does it mean if you raise your hand or not? Not much, right? So anyway. Anyway, um, cool. Uh, did you have any other ideas that you wanted to say out loud here, and not that you didn't have? No, any I think th this was basically it. So now I have enough input to think about it, and I really like the. A uh, comment that Yehuda made about the questions often being binary when there is a lot of things to say. So if I'm going to do something interactive, I will definitely keep that in mind. Awesome. Um, I see people have been tossing around some ideas in the chat also, but does anybody want to um, speak up verbally who we haven't heard from yet? Or I could just call people and make them feel awkward. Okay, Sushita. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, I don't know, most of you don't know me. Hi, I'm Sushita. I work uh, with LinkedIn. Um, and I'm thrilled to be a part of LinkedIn because a lot of code members are a part of LinkedIn, so that's awesome. Um, so tomorrow I'm giving a talk at the RVA JS Conf on Octane, and that's kind of going to be a way where I'm going to show how the whole thing shifted from 1.x to Octane. And um, when I was creating the demo for it, that, that's when I realized, oh my god, this is so awesome. So that's why like, I was thinking, does it make sense to even give such a talk at AmberConf to give a, an example of the journey of how it was before and how it is now or something? Yes, I, I think so. Seeing the progression, sorry, this is Vaidhi. I don't think I've said anything, so hi. maybe <laughs> this sounds like a voice that's like, yes. Uh, I'm hi, I'm Vaidhi. Um, I was just gonna say, I'd love to see uh, talk on Octane um, from the perspective of like, this is this is the progression and this is what changed. And really like fr either from like a, it could be like more technical, like here are the actual pragmatic things of what changed, but I'd also love to see a talk on like, here's why this change changes your here's why octane changes the way that you interact right. with and experience ember because i think those could even be you could go two different ways with that but I, I was mentioning this in the chat um i think there are a lot of good opportunities for talks with octane um and that just might be because that's what's on the forefront of my mind but um if you've been working with that like i think there's gonna be a lot of people in the audience who are like want some sort of guidance or some sort of template of like how do i approach this how do i think about it um how do I learn from somebody who's already done this? Uh, so it'll make it easier for me. So I think your ideas would, it, some, a lot of people would benefit from 
Awesome. Because great, I, great idea. Thank you. Because I feel like one of the pain points that I saw from most of the people is um, it's steep learning curve that Amber introduced when it was there before. But with Octane, it is so, so easy because now it's more in line with how the native JavaScript ecosystem is. So that's why like, I was very excited. So I thought, OK, let me hop on this call and at least get some input from you guys to see what you guys think about that. Yeah, I, I think this is great. I think in general, um, I would categorize that as like a case study talk. And um, generally speaking, I try to accept like a handful of case study talks, but not to fill up the program with them. And I agree with the with Vaidehi and if anyone else said anything, um, that this is this feels like a good and timely case study talk for this conference. Well, I I think I want to add. Correct me if I'm wrong, but like. Uh, Octane is <clears throat> new enough and still in the works enough that I think a lot of people are thinking like, but I don't really yet know exactly how XYZ intimate detail is going to work. Um, and that's totally okay. Like I think it, you wanna be clear about that in your proposal, but like basically you're gonna do the writing, not now, you're gonna do the writing of the talk over the next four or five months where the rest of all those details are gonna feel clearer. So don't like, don't not do a talk because you're like, here, this part's still a little bit of a black box to me, right? Pitch it, right. and you can even say in your pitch, like, this thing is still actually under debate, and the core team is still figuring out how exactly this is going to work, and so it'll be current <clears throat> at the time of the conference based on what happens between now and then. Oh, awesome. That's very helpful. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, when someone pitches an idea, if you hear quiet after that, it's not because it's a bad idea or I don't want to say anything. It's because I think Yehuda also, we don't want to just stop everybody else from talking. So we'll fill the vacuum if it really happens. But anyway, who did I just accidentally cut off? <laughs> yeah, that was me, actually. <laughs> OK, yeah, I, I just wanted to say, uh, with regards to this talk, I actually find it quite interesting. Uh, and I'm looking at it from the perspective of uh, people who have probably used Ember before and do not use Ember anymore. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting because it's going to show a, a paradigm change in the way which Ember actually works. Uh, if I recall correctly, uh, there was a tweet, there was someone who actually tweeted that the last time he used Ember it was when it was in One X, and now he used Octane and he, he could not believe, you know, how Ember had progressed. So I think, I think in terms of evangelism also about Ember, this is also going to be a very good talk here. Awesome. Absolutely. Thanks, Jim. Um, what else? I see lots of people talking in the chat, so I know we have ideas. Oh, Preston, you said you might have something to say. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, so I have no idea what like what length of these would be, but like one idea I had was just like um, like on submitting RFCs, like instead of just complaining about something you don't like, like actually thinking about how you would solve it and getting feedback on that and then iterating on that. Um, but yeah, I don't know how long, like how much time I could use with that. So do, um, I, my, do you mean there like was the, a really... One second, do you mean the, um, like that you wanna talk about the intimate details of creating an RFC or how to have productive conversation on an RFC? Uh, like, I don't know, I guess maybe both, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, there was a really great talk about the RFC process at RustConf a couple of years ago, which was called like something something State of the Union or something, and it was about it was by uh, the person who made the RFC for adding the union types to Rust, and it was like sort of framed around. I'm not. This is an idea. You don't have to use this idea, but I think it's good to watch the talk anyway. Like it's, your talk is really on the same topic. Anyway, it used a particular RFC that didn't have like the slam dunkiness of a lot of RFCs and sort of walked through like what the process was to get it all the way through. Um, and what was nice about it was that it, it actually did cover a few of the things that it sounds like you want to cover. Like don't expect that you'll submit an RFC and it will just get immediately accepted, but you might get some feedback and it actually helps to listen to it and iterate and hear it like here are some things you could experience that might that would be good to understand the context of whatever, right? And I, I, I actually would love to have a talk that was like that talk at EmberConf because I think, like, like I said before, it helps to look like in some sense you could just watch that other talk and it has the same meaning more or less. 
but it helps to localize it, I think, for our community. Cool. If you can't find it, just ping me on Discord and I'll try to help you find it. Yeah, I think right. um, yeah. one of the challenging but also interesting parts of a talk like that would also be like, uh, there will inevitably be people who comment on your RFC who are not that productive or I want to say might be jerks. Uh, and the, the delicate part is talking about that without actually like putting anything on the stage that's like, look at this person, they were a jerk. Uh, so, but it, it's absolutely doable and it's worth addressing. Um, and I think if you look hard enough for a talk like this, you'll also find some cases um, where you will find people seemingly being jerks and then everybody like responding in a helpful way that led that to be productive, right? Like not everybody just gets written off because they didn't necessarily present themselves very well, but oftentimes like that's part of one of the things I love about the RFCs. It's like you'll get a long thing of like a million comments and you can uh, see someone earlier on and then like 20 comments later how they've totally shifted their perspective or they're like, oh, I I'm, I apologize. I was like, let me explain why I was so passionate and grumpy about it or whatever. Um, and it's been nice to like watch that little evolution on threads. Um, who else? Lots of ideas, but I, I'm going to, and I see people I think it would be okay to like, but I don't, I don't want to make anybody feel bad if they don't want to speak up. I know that um, uh, Jan has some ideas, Venus had some ideas, Devin posted some ideas. Do any of you want to say anything? Uh, well, yeah, I, I can uh, share a few ideas. Uh, so one thing that we're doing at my company is uh, we're using a monorepo. Um, so we are using a Yarn workspace uh, to, in one repository, host uh, multiple engines and also add-ons and then the core application. And that would be quite an interesting talk, I guess. And then there's also, um, I, I was very interested in to see how tracked under the hood actually works. The, the Glimmer VM, the stuff that's change tracking, uh, because that's actually kind of like a bit of magic to me. Um, and I never really dug down deep into the code, uh, but I think this would also be interesting for exploring. Uh, so personally, I would say that the talk on the Munarepo, I would absolutely love to watch it. Uh, I would definitely love to listen to that. Um, I've had to learn about that the hard way, so if, if there would be a way for others not to basically go through the hard way, then plus one for me, absolutely, that would be great, yes. Cool. I really like the idea of going deep. I said this in the chat, but I'll just reiterate it for anybody else. I like the idea of going deep into how something works, um, especially if you can find out a way to tie it back into the practicality of it. Like um, I was rewriting my app, like I was shifting to Octane and there are no more computer properties. This is what computer properties used to do. Now you can use track. What is track? Maybe I'll go a little bit deep into what it is and what you might need to know about it. But here are some things you don't need to know, but they're cool. But also tie it back to something practical so it's not completely a deep dive into something technical that leaves the audience with nothing that they come away with. Uh, that's the only thing that is like, you have to be a little bit careful when you're like towing the line with technical talks, as long as you can tie it back to like, here's why it's relevant to you as a Ember developer or as a front end developer. I think it'll be really useful. I would love to see a talk on that. I, I would also say for new Octane features, uh, track is probably the biggest one, but also like Glimmer components. <coughs> um, it is since this is going to be the first time people really get a deep dive into them. It would it's important to cover the new programming model first and like try to center around it. It would be very easy. I mean, the React community does talks like let me implement use state for you, and I like I am just going to tell you that I am not enthusiastic about. A talk that's like let me re-implement tracks for you so you can understand it. Um, whereas like here's all you need to know to be productive. Here is like a rather involved example that you might have thought would be hard to implement, but actually it's really easy. And here is how you can start to think about things in the new way that will help you understand why that rather elaborate example worked, like just worked. Like person, I'm, I'm just speaking for myself. Like other committee members can speak up also, but I would find that more compelling. Um, and I think I do. I think it would be good to get 
a few talks that were about the like the banner features, which are like the Glimmer component features, the native class features, and track. I think those would be good talks. But they really need to be focused on like this is it's not going to be a good time to spend 15 minutes talking about like what's not great about it yet, for example, or to like talk about next steps because it's the first talk about it, right? So like it's going to be important to take the 30 minutes to really cover how to think about it. Cool. Some other ideas that people have been um, chatting about in the chat are talks on accessibility, talks on AST and AST with a linter, uh, yeah, uh, yarn workspaces, um, and these are all ideas that are jumping out from the chat because lots of people are plus wanting them. In place. So if you're one of the people for one of those ideas, uh, I expect to see it in the CFP. Uh, anybody else? would like to speak up. Uh, I also have an idea for the like the dependency management, like uh, the peer dependency and one you put your Ember add-on or NPM packaging dependency versus dev dependency and how that affects your uh, your build vendor.js or if you have Ember engine, what it goes into the engine vendor. Uh, would that be helpful? And also, um, uh, sorry, I, I didn't hear that. Can you repeat the solution that? for the nested add-on and how that affects the uh, uh, your final asset? I did not understand. For some reason, I can't really hear you. How would you turn that into a full talk, though? Like, there's a list of rules and usually last one and wins. Can you talk more through that idea? Yeah, sure. Like, um, especially when you are an add-on author, uh, you need to be aware what you put into your dependencies and or your dev dependency in your package or JSON and how those assets goes into the apps vendor or the engine vendor. Right. I think this actually sounds like a great mini talk, to be honest. Like, I think there's real advice to give and a description, but I think if you try to get into it in 30 minutes, it's not like you can't. It would just feel really confusing to a lot of people right. if you try to expand it. But I do think it's a good mini talk. And as Leia said, the 15 minute talks are experimental, and I can't rule out the possibility that it would be a good 15 minute talk, although I think, I think even that is pushing it. Yeah. yeah, I think I agree with some of the comments, like, I think that it could be a piece of a bigger talk about good practices for writing add-ons, but I like I what I would try to what I would encourage is to try to focus on practical advice and clarity, and not to ha I wouldn't want to have a thirty-minute talk that just made it seem very baroque and complicated. I don't like I it's not that there aren't any complicated aspects. It's just that I like I as a user when I'm going to make a new add-on. I always end up in one of two modes because I don't write that many new add-ons. I either like get a good starting point and good advice and just like go ahead and start writing an add-on or I get like land on a blog post that wants to tell me a lot of things and I just like can't write anything. So I, I just think try to, if you're going to give a talk on good add-on practices and I, I don't, I think we must have had talks on that but I think it's like a perennially good topic. Try to focus on like making it clear and like here is like how you would make an add-on. And like you don't have, it doesn't have to be. I'm not saying you should keep it simple. Like you should avoid getting into the details. I'm just saying ground the details in like real practical advice and examples. Yeah. Also, um, you mentioned blog posts. Uh, Jen literally just typed what I was saying. Do you want to say it, Jen? <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, one thing that can be useful as an exercise to figure out what you want to talk about at what level of detail and to get some early feedback is to write a blog post about it. Um, because it, like, I find it very difficult to write the proposal up front because that act of like trying to hone it down to like a, you know, persuasive pick my talk message is pretty difficult, but the act of like, hmm, what would I, what do I want to teach some, 
someone about what do I want to share, putting that in writing in a blog post, which can be nice and messy and I can mix up my scope and everything is really a great exercise. Um, I would say if you like writing, um, just general advice to everyone, if you like writing, um, I encourage you to try to write a blog post um, or just even sketch out the outline of a blog post as part of your process for figuring out where you want to focus on your talk. If you don't like writing or you haven't done many blog posts, um, be careful that you don't set that in front of yourself as a blocker. Um, because like, for example, I'll use my husband as an example. He doesn't do much blog post writing. Um, he would give a very good technical talk, a uh, very good like lightning talk or something like that. But uh, if, if someone told him write a blog post first, then he would never get to the point where he gives the talk. And so it really just depends on who you are and how you like to work, but it's something that works really well for me. And working on a talk, by the way, is a really great opportunity to generate your own content if that's something that you're interested in. Like, as you're working on the actual materials, you're gonna hit a lot of like smaller areas where you're gonna learn a lot and um, maybe they fit into the talk and it's like, like a bunch of blog posts that if they were all smushed together are your talk or maybe it's just completely things where it's like I can't go down this road in my talk because it's too much detail, but um, that it's just a really great opportunity for um, content generation. So we are, we're hitting 11 o'clock, so we're gonna start losing people. Um, I like a lot of the ideas I heard. I like even more than that I saw in the chat that I'm going to um, read through after and kind of uh, sneak out a bunch of different ideas, but does anybody else want to quickly try and um, sneak in their idea or thing that they want to say before we start dropping off? I had two quick general pieces of advice, just generally for anybody who didn't speak up or if you still are trying to figure out your ideas. Two things that I think are really helpful when you're thinking about what talk to submit is to write the talk that you wish existed that doesn't exist. Um, generally, that puts you in a really good position to write a talk that will address the pain points you felt. So like, if you wish there was a talk on X and it doesn't exist, write that talk and fill in those gaps. Um, and it'll definitely be helpful to someone. Um, and the other thing is make sure you write, make sure you're giving a talk that you're excited about, whether that's something you learned or you wanna learn because inevitably you're gonna spend a lot of time on it. So a good indicator of whether something's a good talk idea or not is if it gets you really excited um, because chances are you will not be the only person. Someone else will also be excited to hear that talk. Cool. And then also in terms of like tips and whatnot, uh, there are a lot of people who want to help. Um, we could do a conference every year where the same time people get up on stage and say different things every year, but no one's really interested in that. Uh, so the idea of somebody new who hasn't been around is very intoxicating. And we usually end up with a very good mix of uh, like established community people, established speakers, and new to our community people, and new to speaking people. Um, and basically at every point along the way, there are so many people who are like excited to help you with your proposal, to, excited to help you flesh out your slides. There's like an Ember Talks channel, there's an Ember Conf channel, there's the learning team, there's everybody basically everywhere. Uh, so point being, there's a lot of support um, and not everybody's need for support looks the same. So it doesn't really matter what yours looks like, but uh, we'll help you, let us help you. Uh, it's okay to, I see Jen popping some tips in there that I like as they're flying by. It's totally okay indeed to submit a talk that you have given uh, before. Uh, they are not, talks are not single use and they shouldn't be um, considering how much work we put into them. And even if they're recorded somewhere else, like most people are not gonna be watching every video on the internet and probably haven't seen it, right? So we definitely make sure there's a balance of like fresh content at the conference, but it's totally the case that a bunch of like our best talks sometimes have been given elsewhere, um, either at another conference or at a meetup, which is a great place yeah, to I, practice. With I talk. think I want to say a stronger thing than that, which is actually this is me speaking on behalf of the committee, which I shouldn't do, but I'll say a personal belief that I have. I think this year we should just not penalize meetup talks at all. I think um, we really do encourage people to give a run, a pre-run at a meetup, and there are so few people at a meetup that I think, considering it was given at a meetup as like 
equivalent of a not do talk is wrong. Like I think we yeah. really, really would want to encourage people to give talks at meetups, even in many places, to get the talk I mean, to be good. Once you're in, you're in. But in the imaginary keeping of score, you get more points for a rehearsal or giving a talk at a meetup, not less. Right. And I, I would also say that um, if you're going to give a talk at another conference, um, if you're re-giving a talk at another conference, it would be very useful to write in the speaker notes about ways in which you may have changed it, um, either based on feedback or just for contextual reasons. Because if it was, even, even if it's lightly changed, if you, if you did significant work to iterate on the talk from a previous context, I think I would also consider that much less of a ding than if you just like take your Ember out, your, uh, what's Ember out east talk and like literally don't do anything with it and then plop it into the projector and give it an Ember comp. That's the kind of thing that I think is ding. So just be clear about it. Cool. Um, okay, anything else super critical that people think I missed? The CFP app is up and running. Um, the CFP closes December 1st, so end of the month. Um, there isn't really a rush, and we usually do see a big spike at the end. However, the earlier you submit, the more opportunity you have to get feedback. It's okay to put something in there and say it's a draft. It's okay to put it, there's not like a technical draft status, because we're using an open source app that doesn't have all that many features. But you're welcome to put it in the title. You're welcome to uh, just kind of be clear. Like, if you want to start a draft and you don't want anybody to read it, put it in the comments. Like, this is not ready to be read yet, right? If you are in a draft state but you're open to feedback, you can say that. Um, and even if you're finished, like, maybe you're not really finished. So put it in there. And then if you put it in early, you'll hear from people like Steven, like Melanie, um, who will say things like, oh, I think this could be a great talk. Maybe you should flesh out blah, blah, blah or who will ask questions like, I don't really understand this point in there. Can you clarify for me? Uh, the reviewers will not be able to know who you are when they're asking these questions, so don't reveal your identity in your responses. Um, but it's a great way to make your proposal even better. Yeah, I was just going to reiterate on that uh, with my own experience also. So, uh, EmberConf last year, I recall that uh, when I first put my talk into the CFP, it was nowhere close to being ready. I think I edited it almost seven different times until I got the final version. So even if you're not sure and you just have a couple of words, uh, you can always put that in and just uh, continue iterating and making it better. I think it's easier when you actually start writing, uh, writing it out, then you're actually uh, dropping your ideas uh, basically on paper uh, as opposed to just having them in your head, because yeah, when they're in your head, you can easily lose them. So just uh, let it out and uh, put it out there and then iterate, iteratively actually improve the proposal. Cool. Well, um, I hope to see proposals uh, on some of the topics that we talked about, a bunch of them that we didn't talk about, um, but I hope to see things from all of you folks who took the time to join us today. Uh, this was really fun. It's always really fun. I need to come up with more excuses to just chat with a couple dozen random ever devs because you're cool. Uh, and uh, we will post the recording of this meeting as well as a short list of some of the ideas on the website, hopefully by tomorrow. Um, and yeah, join us in the EmberConf channel on Discord. Join us in the Talks channel. Um, everybody wants to help. Everybody wants to hear what you got to say. You just got to put it down on paper and, uh, and get it over the finish line. Be around, friends.